الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اللهم أعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزنا علما وقول بزدن علما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله uh, Bismillah. There's a few things I wanted to finish before I get into Kitab al-Ilm with Imam al-Ghazali. The, one of the things about Imam al-Ghazali is that he went through what in modern parlance you would call an existential crisis. He, um, he had reached the pinnacle of his profession. He was a professor. And he came from very humble background. And like many people from humble backgrounds who get into positions of great power and authority, they have a very negative influence on them. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton's axiom. But one of the things that he said was that, and he, he said that I learned knowledge for other than the sake of Allah, but knowledge refused to be for other than the sake of Allah. At about the age of uh, 38, he was born in 450, so this would be around um, 488. He began to read uh, pretty seriously in the books of what are called Kutub al-Qawm. These are the books, al-Qawm are the people that are referred to in the hadith, hum al-Qawm la yashqa bihim jirisuhum. They're the folk, the Qawm, who even the people that just sit with them and aren't from them, but they just sit with them, they get sa'adah, they, they, they find happiness. So just being in their company is enough. And traditionally, those people were the people of uh, Tazkiyah, of Ihsan, people of the maqam of Ihsan. And these are the, all of the great ulama are in this category, whether it's Malik, uh, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam Abu Thawr, Imam al Layth, uh, Ibn Wahbin, Imam al Bukhari, all of them are in that category. They're all from the Qawm. But there was a group of them who took it upon themselves to really articulate the whole process of Tazkiyah. And they wrote books about this. The early books were written by people like Imam al-Muhasibi, who was praised by Imam Ahmad. Uh, and uh, he was one of the early people that codified some of the ideas. In the same way that you have grammar, you did not have any grammar before Abu Aswad al-Du'ali. There was no Arabic grammar. Arabs spoke grammatically correct language because their language had reached the pinnacle at the time of the Prophet, which is a miracle in and of itself, that the Qur'an comes at the point. I mean, there's a reason why Shakespeare, and it's an odious an analogy, there's a reason why Shakespeare shows up at the point where English, the English language reaches its pinnacle. Right? So we could not produce a Shakespeare today. It just wouldn't be possible uh, because of the very corruption of uh, the, the English language. It's, it's become a far less um, vehicle for eloquence uh, than it was at his time. And that's why there, if you looked, all those playwrights were around at that time. None of them obviously excelled like he did, but they were all there. In the same way, 
you could not create the poets of the seventh century today in the Arabic language. You couldn't. And, and the Arab poets were like the playwrights of Elizabethan English. They, they were literally at the pinnacle of the Arabic language. So the Quran comes at that time. Now, isn't it interesting that the King James Bible comes right at that time also, right? Which has not been surpassed in its eloquence. So the, the, the grammar came because Abu Aswad al Du'ali was with his daughter and she said, Ma, 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 ahsana sama. And he said, and Najum. And she said, You know, like she said, And she she made this the idafa uh, construct. And what she meant to say was, Because if it was mansub, it would be mansub because of ta'ajub, but she made it majroor. These weren't terms that they even knew. She made it majroor and turned it into an istifham, a question. The ma there becomes mad istifhamiya, right? And so Abu Aswad al Dawali is like horrified <laughs> that his daughter made this mistake. And Sayyidina Omar, uh, because the, you know, people became Muslim from the Persians and from the Africans. And so when they came in, they, they weren't learning the Arabic at the same level. But Sayyidina Omar once uh, saw some people practicing archery. And he said, uh, he said, Because uh, they were missing the target. So he said, get the target correct. And they said, نَحْنُ مُبْتَدِئِينَ يَا أَمِّرُ mu'minin." And he said, Wallahi inna that your, your grammatical mistakes harder on me than your, your, your mistakes with the arrows. And they're related. So, so because he, they should have said, and then it has mubtada and khabar. But instead they put it, but then there's no, nothing to follow it. So, Abu Aswad al Du'ali went to Imam Ali and he said, Yalhanu abna'una, our, our children are beginning to speak grammatically incorrect Arabic. And Sayyidina Ali says, Dawun lahum al Arabiyata, Wabda huna. Al Arabiyatu tanqasimu ila ismin wa fi'rin wa harfin. Fanhu hadan nahu. So Sayyidina Ali said to him, write down the rules of Arabic for them. And he said, and, and, and start here. Arabic is divided into three types of words. Nouns, and ism is more, it's, it's any substantive, like it includes adjectives, and so, so, so ism is not a noun per se in Arabic. It, it includes a, a pronouns and nouns and adjectives. Um, and then he said, fi'run, uh, which is a, a, a verb, and then Harfun, which is uh, the articles, the uh, prepositions. Um, and, 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 and then he said, and go this way. So that's where we got the word nahu, grammar, from Sayyidina Ali. So that begins grammar. So they learned grammar, and, and grammar enabled the Ajam, and the Ajam actually surpassed the Arabs. They actually become the, 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 the carriers of the Arabic language. You look at all the great grammarians, they were all Persians. They become the great grammarians of Islam. So, if you say that grammar is a bid'ah, it's a bid'ah daruriyah, it's a necessary bid'ah. It's wajiba, because it's the only way the language will be preserved. But Sayyidina Omar didn't know the fa'il and the maf'ul and the majroor. He didn't know uh, these things. He didn't know al-nasbu bil qat'i, bin naz'a al-khafid. He didn't know any of these terms. But he knew the language. And he spoke perfect Arabic. And he could understand the Quran. He knew when Allah says, la ilaha, and the la there is nafi lil jins, and that's why ilaha is mansub. He knew what that meant. That it means there's no God. Illallah, istithna, he knew what that meant, illallahu. So they understood that by their fitrah. So it becomes necessary though, 
And in the same way, the tazkiyah of the Sahaba was bil fitra. They read the Quran, they understood the Quran, they were in the presence of the Prophet. ﷺ. He was purifying them, he was making do it. You zakki him. He was giving them tazkiyah. And there's a khilaf about that whether the zakah is God or it's the person out of his own effort. But the, there's mukhlis and mukhlas in the Quran. So you need both. You need the tazkiyah of God, which is the tawfiq, and you need your own energy to do the tazkiyah. So these scholars began to uh, write about tazkiyah. Imam Muhasibi introduced the idea of khawatir, that there's four kinds of thoughts. So he differentiated between the thought process of the human being. He said there's khatar rabbani, khatar malakani, khatar nafsani, and khatar shaitani. So any thought that comes to your mind is from one of these four sources. In reality, all of consciousness is from God. But Allah created a world of asbab. So he has angels that work on his behalf. So the Rabbani thought is a powerful positive thought that you can't disobey. It's the thought that made you fast Ramadan this year and made you just pray Maghrib. These are the Rabbani thoughts that come, that you can't disobey them. The Malakani is the one that got you to do the Sunnah after the... <laughs> it's a lighter. It's something you could take it or leave it, but it's better to take it. The Nafsani is the one that told you, I'm tired, I'm not going to do the Sunnah now. And then the Shaitani was uh, the one that stopped people from praying at all <laughs> out there. So these are the different types of thoughts that people have. And, and Muhasibi uh, put that down. And then you had Abu Talib in Mecca, who wrote Qutul Qulub, the nourishment of the hearts, and talked about the maqamat, identified nine maqams. The, the Christians have three theological virtues. The Muslims have nine theological virtues. And, uh, and, and so... Imam Ghazali, he began to read these books and he was deeply distressed. Because what he was realizing was all of the things that they were talking about that were negative, he, he could see in himself. And so th this is the beginning of his crises. But he, but he was also a very prestigious scholar. He's 38, he's at the 40, I mean that's the peak. The irhasat ir of the Prophet began at about 38. I and mean, that's really when the human being, Aristotle said 49 is the peak. He was 49 at the time he said it. Right? <laughs> but in our tradition, 40 is, is the, the peak. I mean, that's really at the point where you're, you're, you're at the peak because you've got the quwa of the youth and the wisdom of age. And so that, that is really, and then some will say 50 that, that you know, that that's, and some will say 60, that the, the Sheikh Hukha begins at 60. Um, but he was at the peak of his uh, career, intellectually, financially, uh, socially. Uh, kings wanted his company. All of the ulama admitted that he was the best scholar of the time. He could win any argument. He, he, he literally could beat anybody in dialectic because he'd studied Jadal to an extreme degree, so he knew all the ways to argue. He was very um, arrogant by his own admission, but it, he also said that he realized that what he was doing, he was teaching because he wanted stature, he wanted praise, he wanted the jah. And the Prophet warned us about jah and, and mal. He said that these are more dangerous for the religion of a person than a, a wolf in the midst, a hungry wolf in the midst of sheep. Al-mal wal jah. And jah his stature, prestige. This is what speaks, stops many people in the United States from speaking out about uh, the Palestinian issue. Many people in the U.S., they know. They've got careers. Uh, they've got, they're, they're in CNN. They're in uh, uh, all these news agencies. Or they're in academia. And they know that it's a death sentence for their careers. So jah is more important to them than haq, than truth. Chris Hedges is a good example of somebody who's completely destroyed his career and reputation. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Now he's, he's a pariah in, in that community. They won't put him on TV anymore. Why? Because he speaks out against the injustices in Palestine. 
So that's jah. That's what jah does. It prevents you from speaking the truth. And this, this, this uh, controls many, many people, this concern about what other people think. So uh, I was telling one of my sons that he shouldn't care about what other people think. And he, he quoted to me David Foster Wallace, who said, you'll stop worrying about what other people think about you when you realize how little they do think about you. <laughs> so he goes into this crisis, and he's, he said, one day I put a foot forward, the next day I pulled it back, and he was thinking, I really have to do something. And he felt like he was literally on the verge of, of destruction. So he was really going into a, a serious crisis. And what happens is, he loses the ability to speak, literally. He couldn't speak. What's amazing about that, he says, he, he literally, he goes, he shows up, I mean, imagine me tonight coming, and I just, I can't speak. I, I just look out there, and I can't speak, and you guys are all like, what's wrong with him? What's going on? What's up? He couldn't do it. And he's got all these students looking at him. And he's, he's trying to talk and he couldn't do it. He said, God solved the problem for me. He took away the very thing that put him on the top. And suddenly he was on the bottom. And at that point, the doctors say, this is a psychological problem. This is, we, we, we treat the body, we can't, we can't solve this. So who were the psychologists of that time? These were the Atiba and Nafsaniyun. Who were they? They were the people of Tazkiyah. And so he realized he needed, that's what he needed to do. And so he puts his family in a good situation, and he literally sets out on a pilgrimage and becomes a Salik. He goes to Damascus. He, lives, he literally lived in a... And there's, there's the minaret. There's a room where he studied that's still known in the Umayyad Masjid as Ghazali's room. And that's where he did his tazkiyah. He said knowledge was easier for me than action. But he realized that, that the people of tazkiyah are not people of aqwal. They're people of ahwal. They're not people of words. They're people of states. And, and this is the beginning. And this is when he begins to write the Ihya Ulum al -Din. And that's why the most important book in the Ihya Ulum al -Din is the first book. Because all of the other books are predicated on that understanding that first book. And what he does in that first book is he really identifies what knowledge is. So what I want to do just before that is give you a, a model. It comes out of, uh, it, it's, it's an ancient model. And it, uh, in the Western tradition, it's called the Wheel of Fortune. And... Uh, the most important source for this is from one of the most important books of the classical world, which was the Constellation of Philosophy by Bothius. Has anybody read that in here? The Constellation of Philosophy, Bothius. Uh, Bothius was a, he was a Roman consul, brilliant man, and um, he entered into politics even though he was a philosopher, he was a Christian, he was a philosopher. He, he was born in the uh, mid-5th uh, century Christian era and dies in the, uh, in the early 6th century of the Christian era. Anyway, he, uh, he felt compelled to go into politics because he took very serious uh, Plato's words that the world will not be rectified until philosophers become kings or kings become philosophers. And so he felt it was a duty because the world was in such a shambles. This was a very difficult period uh, in, in, uh, in uh, history for uh, many areas in the world. But he, he went into politics, and, and he becomes very, very popular. He was, he was brilliant. He, was, uh, he, he had everything. He came from humble beginnings. Uh, very simple background, but he literally became uh, beloved. Uh, he became very close to the ruler. Uh, everybody looked up to him. But then there was a fitna between uh, the uh, Eastern Church and the Western Church, and he got involved in it. And the next thing he knows, he finds himself in prison, sentenced to death. So he was literally on the top, suddenly he was on the bottom. 
and he writes in 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 prison he writes this book a consolation the consolation of philosophy and in in the book uh, philosophy comes personified as a beautiful woman and he's there grieving and feeling self-pity and sorry for himself and philosophy comes and says you know you studied all these high things and now look at you you're pathetic and and then begins to explain to him and anyway chapter two deals with this model and so I want to just look at this model uh, I think it's a very useful model um, but uh, let, let me just read you a little section. So, perhaps the hallmark of the medieval worldview was, uh, is this story of the, the Wheel of Fortune. Um, and C.S. Lewis was of the opinion that it was the, one of the most influential books ever written in Latin. He thought that to acquire a taste for it, was to almost become naturalized into the Middle Ages. At the heart of this naturalization lies the myth of fortune that challenges the modern myth of progress. Lewis was hostile to progress because he did not find it a comforting myth, but a cruel one. He proposes the myth of fortune as a defense against the progressive view, common to vulgar pagans and to vulgar Christians alike, which comforts cruel men by interpreting variations of human prosperity as divine rewards and punishments. You see, one of the things like Africans, because they're poor, people really don't care about Africa. And, and in the bottom, it's because of this myth. And this is a Protestant sickness, but it's also found amongst the Muslims. This idea that somehow, that if you're graced with wealth, it's because God's obviously pleased with you because uh, if he's impoverished you and put you in a bad condition, well, gee, that must be because he doesn't like you. Because if I like people, I like to give them things. And if I don't like them, I like to withhold things from them. This is the, the way that people think. And so this Protestant idea that wealth is a sign of God's grace Therefore, the Americans are obviously the most graced people on earth, and God loves them because they're the wealthiest country on earth. And obviously, the Palestinians, look at the Israelis. They have everything. The Palestinians don't have anything. Therefore, they're obviously chosen. God's chosen them over these pathetic Palestinians that can't do anything for themselves. So what he's saying is it's a cruel myth because it convinces the oppressor, who often misuses his power that he's been given, that somehow he's divinely sanctioned to do so, and that he can do what he wants with impunity, and he always wears the white hat, the myth of the, the good guys. I mean, this is one of the great myths of my culture, uh, and I, if you're from Australia or England or any of the European countries, this is a myth that we're always right. The Eurocentric worldview, that other peoples don't seem to count, uh, that, that when we go into India and colonize it, this is the British idea, when we go into India and colonize it, we're doing it for their own good. These are backward people. And isn't it interesting that when Christianity was the dominant ideology in Europe, they needed to spread this wonderful Christianity and, and remove these backward religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. So that was their impulse then, always with the commercial agents alongside the missionaries, right? So let's spread Christianity because they're so ignorant. Now that they've gotten rid of Christianity, they've convinced themselves that, oh, these backward fascistic Muslims and these despotic Asiatics, we need to bring them liberal democracy because this is obviously the most superior form of government because it's our form of government. And these horrible Gulf Arabs, look at these terrible sheikhs. That, that control their people. Look at these poor women. Uh, our women are so liberated. Just look at Las Vegas, <laughs> right? And look at these poor women in, in bags walking around, right? And then they tell you, don't let the sun get near your skin because it's going to give you skin cancer. I mean, if you go to a Saudi Arabian lady, she's like 80 years old. She's had her face covered her whole life. Her skin's like porcelain. Right? People that know this that have been there, right? And you're saying, how does the sheikh know what's behind the veil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife told me. <laughs> they don't need all these creams that they pay millions of dollars for. 
They just keep that face thing on and they never get the sun. So they don't get wrinkles. <laughs> I'm not making a case for the face veil. <laughs> it's a orf, you know. I mean, there's some people that argue that it's sunnah, but it's a stronger opinion. It's orf of a people. If it's their orf, that's fine. If it's not their orf, then... But that, you know, this is the, the Eurocentric view. You know, this is the disease of, uh, of, of the people in the West. And, uh, and it's really, it's not about color. Don't think it's always about color. Because the Irish are as white as the moon. And they, they've had 800 years of uh, Anglo-Saxon hospitality. Right? And the Welsh are the Irish that couldn't swim. Right, <laughs> Nabil? Is Nabil here? Uh, is that, come on, admit it. <laughs> yeah. So, he regarded all notions of progress as forms of social Darwinism. I mean, isn't it interesting, you know, their imam is Darwin. The, the, that we're evolving, and obviously the most evolved group of people according to uh, Samuel Huntington, are the Northern Europeans. Even their skin's the most evolved skin, right? Because we began, we were dark as coal. That's the first people, according to science. Now we're evolving, getting lighter and lighter. So th these, are, these are real myths that, that people carry around. So Lewis found the myth of fortune closer to the Christian myth, and I would argue that it's, it's completely Islamic, and I'll, and I'll show you how, how it is. In Christianity, they say the sun rises on the evil and the good. In our belief, Allah gives to, he provides for the kafir and the mu'min. God sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In the myth of fortune, human beings find themselves on this inexorably turning wheel. So the 12 o'clock position, the 12 o'clock position is Regno, right? Uh, Eisenhower, America. Regno, the, the corresponding emotion that goes with, with I rule, ahkumu, I'm the hakim, is joy, farah. It's, it's, you're happy, you're on top of the world, right? They say, I'm on top of the world. That's 90 degrees, sun's directly overhead, right? But all things must fade, right? The English would like to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. Now it's the most indebted country on the planet, right? Seriously. I mean, look at the English in, in, the, in the pubs. Look, Where's the English gentleman? Where are all those ideals? Where's the world of Jane Austen? Seriously, where's all that gone? <laughs> right? So rule Britannia, Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, rule Britannia. We'll never, never, never be slaves. Well, you're slaves to the IMF. You're slaves to your mortgage brokers, slaves to your lower passions, right? I'm mostly Irish, so I can pick on the Anglo-Saxons a little bit. Regnave is three o'clock. Chauf. This is, I, I ruled. This is where America is now. That's why they're so scared. Right? We were up here, and now, uh-oh, we're indebted to China. Our GDP, right? Our, our debt is greater now than our GDP. And they're, you know, they've got the Wall Street guys saying, don't worry, Oh, we, we, that was the way it was before World War II. Yeah, well, uh, after World War II. Well, after World War II, you were the most industrial country on the planet, producing more goods and services than any other country. In the world. Well, we still are, not for long, right? Be because basically the, the number one industry in America uh, that's making the most money for these corporations is, is making war machines, right? It's not a really good thing to do. The number one uh, entertainment industry in America is pornography. It's surpassed all other forms of entertainment in terms of money 
uh, uh, production. Not something to be really proud of, right? So that's fear, and that's why there's so much fear. The Time magazine had a cover, are you, are, are you scared yet? And there's always, you know, all, all these, you know, fear. Even though Roosevelt said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, now fear is cultivated in America. Barry Sanders' book, The Culture of Fear, right? Is your sink covered with deadly microbes? News at 11, you know, uh-oh, better watch that. And then obviously it's to sell, are you, what, what are you doing? Uh, I don't want any pictures taken, thanks. You know, so that, right, that, that's what they do. And that's in order to sell antimicrobials. So now everybody's washing their hands with antimicrobials. The doctor's saying, this is a disaster. <sighs> SubhanAllah, because they've got everybody afraid of germs. No, you need to learn to live, coexist with the germs. Right? Children need to play in the mud, get dirty. Now they're having all these skin problems because children don't, don't play outside anymore. Right? People that are exposed to these things are stronger because their immune system. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But no, it's all fear. So this is, this is the regnavi, fear. Kuntu ahkomo. But then you go down. So there's the sun is fading. Now the sun, it's set. Sum sin regno. I used to rule. I don't have a kingdom anymore. This is where the Muslims were. See, the Muslims were up here. But the wheel of fortune swung. And now we're down here. What's the corresponding emotion? Joy, fear, depression, sorrow, huzn. All these Muslims saying, I'm so depressed. I'm so, I'm, I feel so much grief. Look at our conditions. Look at Because we're down here. We're in Sumsin Regno. We used to rule. أَصْبَحْتُ كُنْتِيًا وَأَصْبَحْتُ عَاجِنًا وَشَرُّ خِصَالَ الْمَرْءِ كُنْتِيًا وَأَعَجِنُوا I used to be this and I used to be that. And the worst qualities of a man is the one who says, I used to be this and I used to be that. That's what the Arab poet says. <laughs> I used to be this, I used to be that. They call it kunti in Arabic. Kuntiyun is a person that's, who's always saying, I used to be this and I used to be that. That's the Muslims. We're kuntiyun. Regnabo, I will rule. India, the BRIC countries, right? Brazil, right? These, these are the, like, China. Yes, China, right? The rising sun, right? And, and this is what's scaring these guys over here. So the wheels in spin, right? And you'll see these motifs in literature a lot. You'll even see it in modern uh, popular uh, literature. There's a song from the 60s that was the anthem of the whole 60s protest movement. Uh, come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and don't speak too soon and keep your eyes wide for the chance won't come again and don't speak too soon because the wheel's still in spin and there's no, t no telling who that it's naming and the first one now will be later to win and the, and the last one now will be later to win and the loser now will be later to win. The one down here is going to come up here. And the loser now will be later to win for the times they are changing. In other words, the wheel of fortune is changing. He later actually said a more apocalyptic statement, which is where he said, uh, now everything's a little upside down. As a matter of fact, the wheel has stopped. What's good is bad. What's bad is good. You'll find out when you reach the top, you're on the bottom. So this is the motif of the wheel of fortune. Now. Right, the, the lesson of this is that nobody can stay on the top forever. That's what Imam Ghazali learned. He was in a delusional state. And, 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 and he was given a great gift. And the great gift is to find yourself at the bottom. That's actually a great gift from God. People don't want it, but it's a great gift because it, it, a lot of openings come with it. The openings don't come. Opportunities come with that regno, because you can do a lot of good, but most people don't. When they're on top, they squander it. Even the technological conquest of nature may be a temporary 12 o'clock victory. Right? This is what people think now. Oh, we're, we're, 
you know, we can solve all these problems with technology. Maybe the technology will actually end up destroying us. Think of, global, think of six o'clock calamities like global warming, environmental disaster, and nuclear accidents. Middle-class Westerners outwardly may live life at 12 o'clock on the wheel, but the majority of humanity does not. Historians estimate there were roughly 400 million people on Earth before the advent of modern science and technology. Let's assume that 95% of these people lived at below or uh, at or below harsh subsistence levels. By the year 2000, world population exceeded 6 billion, and by 2012, over 7 billion. We're, we're headed towards 12 billion, and then it's supposed to begin to bottom out, peak. However, today, although a greater percentage of humanity lives above a harsh subsistence level, in absolute numbers, a far greater number of people live at be or below the level of medieval serfs. In fact, one researcher proved that medi medieval serfs actually lived much better than modern people, had much more leisure time, ate better food, right? We're not surrounded by all these toxins. According to the World Bank, 1.4 billion people now live on less than $1.25 a day, and 3 billion live on less than $2.50 a day. So there are six times as many people living at or below harsh subsistence level than there were in the Middle Ages. Is this progress? It is if your perspective on life is from the 12 o'clock view, but not necessarily if your perspective is from the 6 o'clock position. Regarding the barbarity of medieval times, and no one can deny that they were barbar not barbaric, slavery, serfdom, torture, inquisition, crusades. It is only fair to note that in sheer numbers, medieval atrocities pale before the technological barbarism of modernity. Medieval tactics were gruesome, and their, but their effect was limited compared to contemporary warfare. We have now all these medieval Muslims using medieval tactics that are gruesome, but look at the numbers. How, they may be cut off 50, 100, 200 heads. The technology kills a million people. I mean, look how many people the, the, the American wars have killed in Afghanistan and Iraq. Okay, so you've got these medieval barbaric idiots chopping off a few heads, but look at how many people have been killed by all this technology. And this, this is the point. They're both barbaric. One's just sanitized. It's just sanitized. You, know, you drop a bomb from 30,000 feet, it's a lot easier than having to chop off somebody's head. But, right, what's the result? Huh? If you don't die by the sword, you die by some other reason. There's a lot of ways to die, but death is one. So whether you drop a bomb from 30,000 feet or chop off the head, they're both barbaric, sorry. It's just on YouTube, it looks a hell of a lot more barbaric when you're chopping off the head than it does some guy in a cockpit that's just pushing a button. But the results of the guy in the cockpit pushing the button are far more devastating for human beings than that idiot that just chopped off somebody's head on YouTube. You know, so let's be realistic about this. In the 20th century alone, estimates of people killed through war, genocide... Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in the 20th century alone, estimates of people killed through war, genocide, and liquidation run from a low of 80 million to a high of 300 million people. 300 million people. In World War II, everybody talks about the Holocaust. Nobody talks about the Russian Holocaust. Nobody talks about the Russian, because they were communists. So it wasn't this nice little uh, propaganda piece to put out there. 20 million Russians were massacred, slaughtered by the Nazis. 20 million. Can you imagine that? And the Russians won World War II. It wasn't the Americans. All the films show the Americans winning the war. The Ru Just look at the divisions of the Nazis that, that were on the Eastern Front. Multiple times more than the divisions on the Western Front. If the Nazis never invaded Russia, we'd probably speak in German right now. Seriously, the Russians won World War II. And then the myth of religious violence. Like, well, what is that? This myth of religious violence. Muslims, 
th this is the most violent religious period in the history of Islam, probably. If you look at the, the historian who did the body count study, which is online, proved that the single most violent civilization in human history is the secular humanistic civilization. It's killed more people than any other civilization. The second is Christianity, just by looking at historical numbers. The, out of the seven civilizations studied, Islam was the sixth, number six. The only less violent civilization than the Muslim civilization was the Hindu civilization. <laughs> Amazing. Muslims are accused of being violent everywhere. The Ottomans, the, the Ottoman civilization was the most multicultural civilization in human history and in many ways surpassed modern multiculturalism because they allowed communities, minority communities, to be completely independent. They had their own court systems. They could judge the people themselves. The Jews had their own court systems in, in, Ottoman, uh, in Ottoman countries. In Iraq, they had three vilayats, three. They had the Shia, the Sunni, and, and the Kurdish vilayat. They didn't force them all to live together. They let them live in their own environment, just like they're asking now for independence. Each one wants to live on its own. The Ottomans, that was their administration. Let the Turks control their own territory. Let the Kurds control their own territory. Let the Shia control their own territory. And let the Sunnis control it. Just pay us tax, and we'll take care of you. Huh? <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we have a, a mafioso, you know, I'll make you a deal you can't refuse. I mean, they, they talk about Muslims want everybody to pay jizya. What, what's the Muslim world paying to American corporations if it's not jizya? It's all protection money. Seriously, look at the amount of money that Muslims are paying for weapons from the United States. And why are they buying those weapons? What, to fight Israel? <laughs> they can't because the F-16s that they buy don't work against Israeli jets. <laughs> they are, they're always one step behind. They'll never give you the technology that they've got. They give you the last, you know, it's like, it's like buying a used computer. You know, it's having like, you know, okay, give the Saudis the 286. We've got the Pentium. Remember 286? You guys are too young. So no one stays on top forever. This medieval myth may well provide a more accurate understanding about the human condition than the myth of progress. Of course, neither story is scientific in any rigorous sense. However, since as one with a wide exposure to all humankind's stories, not just the modern ones, one need not accept all of Lewis's neo-romantic notions to entertain the possibility that the Western culture buried some of its gems along with its crimes in the past. At the very least, in order to face the adage of Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Head on, there is no harm in digging them up and seeing if they still shine. Okay, so that's very important. Uh, and then... So I want to show you now the, uh, the Wheel of Fortune in the Quran. And there are many verses that indicate the nature of this wheel. But I think the most striking, and I, this came to me in this Ramadan, reading this uh, verse, uh, which is Surat Yunus, in chapter, uh, in uh, verse 21. وَإِذَا أَذَقْنَا النَّاسَ رَحْمَةً مِنْ بَعْدِ ضَرَّاءً مَسَّتْهُمْ And if we cause people to taste mercy after harm had afflicted them. And Allah attributes the rahmah to himself, but the darra is masathu, darra. Ida lahum makrun fi ayatina. And then you see them uh, with their makar, which is their craftiness concerning our sign. We're, we're showing them signs, and yet they're reinterpreting them for their own advantage. So we, we showed them how, OK, America, you're on top now, but it used to be Britain. Remember that? And remember when France was on top? Remember? And Britain wasn't on top? Remember when Portugal was on top? Now look at Portugal. Right? Remember Henry the Navigator? 
They used to rule the world. Spain, remember when they were on top? In other words, don't you see the wheel? But why are you convinced your Mecca in our signs is to tell yourselves, we'll always be on top? And the thing about knowing that one day you're going to be on the bottom, you're going to be treating people a little nicer because maybe they'll be nice to you when they get to the top. You see, all these uh, Arabs that treat Pakistanis and Indians like crap, right? Maybe one day India is going to be the dominant power in the world, and suddenly your sons are going to India to get jobs in their houses to serve them. Yeah. Maybe they're going to remember those stories their grandma told them about being a servant in your house. Right? What goes around comes around. قُرِ اللَّهُ أَسْرَعُ مَكْرًا you, you, you plot, you've got your little crafty cleverness. Well, we've got our plan too. Right? Our messengers, our angels are writing it all down. What you're doing while you're on top, they're writing it all down. He's the one that circulates you. On the land and in the sea. Tirka layam nudawiluha bainan nas. Dawla, the circle, nudawiluha. We cause it. One day you've got it, the next day you don't. Nudawiluha bainan nas. Nusayyirukum fil barri wal bahar. We circulate you in the land and on the sea. We give you power. Allahumma malik al mulk. Tu'ti al mulk man tasha. Wa tanzi al mulk min man tasha. We give power to whom we please, and we take power away from whom we please. We exalt whom we please. We put you on the top, and we abase whom we please. We put you on the bottom. Now look, here's the metaphor, and this is a perfect wheel of fortune. حَتَّى إِذَا كُنْتُمْ فِي الْفُرْكِ وَجَّرَيْنَ بِهِمْ بِرِيحٍ You were on a ship. Now this is a metaphor, right? This is an analogy. You were on a ship. Jara means to circulate, to go around also. And jara, jarena, the ship, jariya means ship also. It means a young woman because she goes around serving in the house. A jariya was a servant girl. She's tajiri fil bayt. The jariya is a ship that circulates. It goes out and comes back. You see, it goes out and comes back. And you don't know profit or loss. You never know. So, there you are on your ship. And the ship happens upon a nice wind. 12 o'clock. And they've got joy. جاءت جاءت ريح عاصفون. Suddenly a storm starts to appear. Right? So now you're, you're happy, but uh-oh, there's a storm over there. Fear sets in. Three o'clock. Then what happens? Then the waves start coming from every direction. Now they're on the bottom, right? What happens? And they think they're going to be destroyed. It's over. Despair, sorrow, grief. And then what happens? Then they call on God, hoping. <laughs> right? And what do they say? What do they say? If you just save us min hadhihi from this, you see, when they're here, they say, when I get into power, I'm going to rectify everything. That's what they say. This is in the traditional, this is, this is the traditional schema of this. This guy says, he's the prince, hoping to ascend. And what he says, I'm going to get rid of the oppressors. I'm going to do all that, right? That's what he does. But then what happens when Allah does it? He gets, and then we put them in power. And what do they do? They start to oppress. Now they're on regno, right? They start to oppress. And then what happens? They don't have any right to do it, but they still do it. 
يا أيها الناس إنما بغيكم على أنفسكم Oh humanity, your oppression is against yourselves. The Israelis aren't oppressing the Palestinians, they're oppressing themselves. They're oppressing themselves. Mata'u al hayat al dunya. This is the mata' of hayat al dunya. Mata'un qalil. Little bit, and then you lose it. لا يغرنك بالله الغرور. Don't get deluded by this circle. When you're on the top, don't get deluded. ثم إلينا مرجعكم فننبئكم بما كنتم تعملون. You're going to return to us, and we're going to explain all of this to you. So just be patient. تربصوا إني معكم من المتربصين. Let's wait. Allah says He's going to explain the whole thing. He's going to tell you why He put the Jews in power. He's going to tell you why they did what they did. He's going to punish the wrongdoers. He's going to rectify the people that were oppressed. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to punish the wrong. That's our promise. إِنَّمَا مَثُلُ الْحَيَةَ الدُّنْيَا كَمَاءٍ The likeness of this world is like water. Right? So the water comes down. أَنزَلْنَاهُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ It mixes with the nabat of the earth. Right? مِمَّا يَأْكُرُ النَّاسُ وَلَا أَنْعَامِ So people eat it and the an'am eat it, the good and the evil. Because بَلْ إِنْهُمْ كَالْأَنْعَامِ So everybody benefits in the dunya, the good people, the bad people. بِلْ I mean, it means literally the cows and the livestock, but also... The bad humans are called an'am in the Quran. So it, everybody benefits from it, the good and the evil. <laughs> but then the earth takes on its ornaments. This is the regno. Everything looks really good. It takes on. <laughs> the people up here, because it's all going well, they think they're all powerful. They think they can do whatever they want. أَتَاهَا أَمْرُنَا لَيْلًا أَوْ نَهَارًا Our Amr comes by night or by day and suddenly they're on the bottom. Right? فَجَعَلْنَاهَا حَصِيدًا كَأَنْ لَمْ تَغْنَ بِالْأَمْسِ We obliterate it like it had no benefit yesterday. So you're down here, you can't even remember what it was like to be up here. كَذَارِكَ نُفَصُّلُ لَآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكِّرُونَ Here we are. Discerning for you are signs that you might contemplate about these things. The nature of dunya, it's daru taghir, it's always changing, it's never going to stay the same. You're healthy today, you might be sick tomorrow. You're wealthy today, you might be poor tomorrow. Don't get deluded. The Prophet ﷺ said, نِعْمَتَانِ مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ السِّحْتُ وَالْفَرَاغِ Two blessings people are cheated out of because they think they're going to last forever. Health and leisure time. So when, you, when you've got leisure time, you don't use it. You don't study. You don't learn. You don't go out and help people. You waste your time. And then, then it's gone and you're like, you're down here. You had it. You didn't use it for what it was for. Wallahu yad'u ila dar as-salam. yahdi man yasha ila sirat al-mustaqeem. Okay, so now God calls to the abode of peace. He just told us about this, the wheel of fortune. That's the, this is not for the believers. Where's Darus Salam? Where's Darus Salam? Yad'u ila Darus Salam, right? Where's Darus Salam? Where is it? In Jannah, it's Jannah, right? But aren't there Mubashirat of Jannah in dunya? Right? They're supposed to be, right? So what is Darul Salam here? Because the Muslims traditionally called the land of Islam Darul Salam, right? Jerusalem was Yerushalam, Yerushalom, right? Baghdad was called Medina to Salam, the city of peace. Muslims are obsessed with peace. Historically, we were obsessed with peace. That was the whole point. Spread peace. The Prophet said spread peace. Our greeting is Assalamu Alaikum. It's not Al-Harbu Alaykum. Sayyidina Ali had a child and he named it Harb, Al-Hasan. He went to the Prophet, he said, Mada Sameitu? Qad Sameitu Harban. Qad Bal Ismu Hasan. He said, no, his, his, his name is not war. His name's 
good, beauty. He came next time, had a child, Sameitu Harban. He went to the Prophet I sent him, he said, what did you call him? He said, Sameitu Harban. He said, Bal ismu al He He had a third child. He wanted a warrior. Sameitu Harban, because the Arabs, they call their sons the names for their enemies. This is Jahli. He was still thinking in the previous time. Because the Jahli Arabs, they named their, their sons names like, uh, you know, Nimr, Asad, Vi'ib. Those were the names they used. Hamdala, bitter, Talha, you know, big, big powerful tree. Because they were names for their enemies. Allah changed that. No, Abdurrahman, slave of peace. Abdullah, slave of God, right? Name, and so he came with third son. He died, but he came with the third son. Mada Sameitu, Harban. But it's Muhsin. His name is Muhsin. Those are the names of the Prophet Al Hassan, beauty, spread good. Al Hussein, he's second in line, so he's a little less than the first one, right? And then Muhsin. So, what, where is Darul Salam on the wheel? Come on, I just put it there. Yeah, so what is this? What do we call this? It's an axis. What else is it called? Huh? What? What's the center of a wheel? What do you call it? Those are spokes or what comes out? It's an ac a hub. Okay, so we'll call it a hub. Okay, so it's all good in the hub. Okay, this is the hub. We'll write it in Arabic, right? Hub. <laughs> right? You want to get into the hub, the hub, the love of Allah. The more you get to the center, the less affected you are by the vicissitudes of time. The more you center your being with God, the more these things become meaningless because you see them as from God. Because God made a world that's very nature is to do this. This is the nature of the world. This is the nature of the world. You have to accept it. Just accept it. Let the wheel spin, but get into the eye of the hurricane. Get into the eye of the hurricane. The eye of the hurricane is complete tranquility, stillness. When ships go into the eye of the hurricane, th there's no storm. It's all peaceful. They're in Darul Salam. And this is why Aslahun Nas in Islam, Aslahun Nas. The most righteous human being, because one of us is the best of us in this time. There is one Muslim who's better than all the other Muslims, because he represents the heart of the Prophet. The, the Prophet was the best of all human beings. The Prophet is the Qutb of existence. He's Qutb al Wujud. He's the axis of existence. That's why he's perfect stillness. He was never perturbed. He went to Ta'if, they spit on him, threw rocks at him, they made him bleed. Did he say, Allah anzal alayhim al adab. Did he say that? No, because he didn't see them as doing it to him. He saw them as a bala from God. And he said, Ila man takiluni. Who are you going to send me to? Ila aduunya tajahamuni, like to some enemy, right? Who doesn't know who I am? He said, If you're content with me, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. Well, afia to awsa. But afia is better. It's nicer to be in good conditions than bad conditions. We're not, we don't have a, a victimization complex like some religions. They actually like to be punished. Right? Muslims don't like that. We would rather be ruling than be ruled. We would rather be that. But if we're under the authority of somebody else, then we know who gave them the power. We're not deluded into thinking they did it themselves because we know who controls the wheel of fortune. Allahumma malik al-mulk. You're the owner of the dominion. You give it to whom you please. Right? So this is where Ghazali was up here and, and then at about 38 he, he was here. Like, this doesn't look good for me. And then he loses his voice and now he's here. The thing that put him here was taken away from him and he finds himself here. He went into a state of depression. But then, Allah Mukhdisin, 
Da'ullah Mukhrisin, he called on Allah with sincerity and he started his journey where? Here. Into the center. And he becomes the Qutb. And this is why none of it affected him at the end of his life. None of it affected him. He had no interest in power, jah. He said, I used to teach kasban lil jah. He said, now I teach how to get rid of jah. He said, I used to teach in order to get stature. Now I'm teaching to help people get rid of this love. Hubb dunya What's our disease? Hubb dunya Loving to be up here. Wa karahiyat. The struggle. Hating to be down here. This is our sickness. That we're trapped in this circle. And this is where Allah is telling us to get to. Be here. And none of it will matter. And then you can struggle, and your struggle will be meaningful. Because right now, you're down here, you're just struggling out of anger. Out of love of vengeance. Right? When Salahuddin al Ayyubi, this is where he was working from. Salahuddin al Ayyubi was working from the center. He didn't, he didn't spend his youth throwing stones at crusaders. He didn't spend his youth throwing stones at crusade. Who, who can tell me what he did as a young man? Huh? He, he, was a, he was a student, and one of the books he studied was the Hiyah. He was a fruit of the madrasa of, of Imam uh, Abu Hamid. He was a Shafi'i scholar. He memorized the Quran. That's what he was doing in his youth. Even though the crusaders were occupying Palestine, he knew, we don't have any power to do it. We, we can't get rid of these people now. So what should I use my time for? To learn the things that will help me. Not just free Al-Quds, but free the people who are oppressing the people in Al-Quds from their oppression. Unsuru akhakum wadiman o madluma. Give help to your brother, even your Jewish brother, your Christian brother. Help them stop oppressing. That's how you, that, the Prophet said, we know how to help victims, how do you help the, the oppressor? He said, by stopping him from his oppression. At least remind him, at least tell him, you're oppressing, you shouldn't do this, right? Because they kill the people that remind them. Allah says that in the Quran, right? Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, right? All Malcolm was doing, he, the tongue was all he had. He didn't, he didn't have any army. And he started from hatred. That's where he was, and that's why if you listen to his early talks, they're just filled with hate. But listen to the, his, his last talk. Nobody wants to hear Malcolm after Mecca. They all want that harsh Malcolm, yeah. They don't want to hear the Malcolm that suddenly realizes People are human beings. White people are human. A lot of them would almost convince you otherwise. I understand that. But they're human beings. Right? Tur Turkish people are white. A lot of them. They don't behave like that sickness. Right? Which some attribute to a lack of melatonin. You need more sun. The sun makes you happy, doesn't it? When the sun comes up. You live in Europe, there's never any sun, you're miserable. You get a bad attitude. But that's, that's Malcolm. Malcolm got there. That's why he, in the end of his life, that's where he was. What's Martin Luther King's right before he dies? I've been to the mountain. Everybody wants longevity. I've been to the mountaintop. He was moving. That's where he, but he started. He understood this. Trust me. He knew this model very well. You know, one thing Martin Luther King said was, if I wasn't against violence on moral terms, for moral reasons, I'd still be against it for pragmatic reasons. That's what Muslims haven't learned that. I'm against modern violence on moral grounds. I, I really am. I am against modern warfare. I don't believe in modern warfare. I don't believe Muslims should be engaged in modern warfare. I really don't. I'd rather be killed than, than kill people with nuclear weapons. I'd rather die than drop a bomb. I really would. I'd rather die than blow up children. I'd much rather be killed than, than kill some innocent person. 
And the prophet said towards the end of time, he said, be the, the best of the two sons of Adam, right? Kun, uh, you know, khayra ibn Adam, be like the best of who, who what? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, Habil, right? Not Qabil. It's, it's, it's Abel, not Cain. You know, in the tafsir of Imam al-Baghawi, what he says, he says that Ibn Abbas said, Cain was actually weaker than Abel. Abel could have defeated him, but he said their sharia was that they weren't even allowed self-defense. And that means, if that is true, that means that the foundation of our tradition is nonviolence. And I would argue that the Prophet would exhaust every nonviolent means before he would go to violent means. He would exhaust every nonviolent means. And that's why at Hudaybiyah, he had every right to fight those people, but he didn't. It was a nonviolent solution to a problem. The Muslims didn't like it. Why? Because al Yasir was being tortured. They were in chains. They're calling on them, help us. The Prophet said, Sabran ya al Yasir, inna mawadukum al Jannah. There's a proof that the Prophet is seeing a Muslim tortured. And he's not doing anything about it. Outwardly. He saw a Muslim being tortured. And he didn't do anything about it outwardly. Because he was a profound strategic thinker. Completely different approach to the problems of the world. That's... What time is it? 9.35? 9.45? I'll give you one more example of the Wheel of Fortune, but you'll see it many times in the Qur'an. It's a very useful model, uh, and I believe it is a Qur'anic model. And Allah is using that example of the, the, the mushrikeen. So they're the ones that are in this circle. The Muslims are supposed to be in the center, right? الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُوا قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُوا الْقُلُوبُ Those who believe and their hearts have stillness, tuma'nina, from the dhikr of Allah. Isn't it by the dhikr of Allah, the hearts are still? Why are they still? Because there's no movement in the hub, in the hub. There's no movement here. These people are not still. They're in complete confusion because it's just, this is their life. Right? This is their life. They're in that samsara of just this constantly turning wheel. And that's why Muslims are confused. They don't understand. Why aren't we on top? If we're the truth, why aren't we on top? Because that's not where the truth resides. It resides here. It doesn't reside here. This is where the truth resides. It's not to be on the top. It's to be in the center. And we've lost our center. This is called kunya bilim markazi. Right? Kunya's scientific center. Right? The center. There's a man, he's called uh, Markazi Afendi. Does anybody, any Turkish people know him? Markazi Afendi? Has anybody heard of him? You heard of him? Who is he? What's that? He was a famous scholar, yeah, but he, he was famous. Why is he called Markazi? Do you know why? He was called Markazi because this is where he resided. And the reason he's called Markazi is because the sheikh was looking for a khalifa. He was about to die. So he asked them, what would you change about Allah's creation? What would you change? And the next day the students came, so he said, what would you change? He said, I'd get rid of alcohol. He said, what would you change? He said, I'd get rid of dhulm. He said, what would you change? He said, I'd get rid of sickness. He said, what would you change? He said, I'd get rid of poverty. All the students said that. And then they looked, he said to Markazi Effendi, what would you change? He said, nothing. Who am I to make the world different from the way Allah made it? It doesn't mean you don't fight against poverty. It doesn't mean you don't fight against oppression. It doesn't mean you don't fight against sickness, it means you understand their hikmah. They're here for a reason. That's the difference. Bitter medicine, people don't like it. It's a drag, huh? It's really, it's like, you have to accept this situation. It's unacceptable. 
العافية أوسع Ask Allah for the afia. I'd rather be in afia. Abid al ihsan la abid al imtihan. You know, we don't want imtihan. We might fail the test, but if Allah tests us, we should be prepared for it. Hope for the best, but expect the worst. Hope for, for a good farah. Wa bi dharika fal yafrahu. Huwa khayru mimma yajma'oon. Be happy about the akhirah. لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَانِ The, the, the Sa'im has two joys. Why? When he finishes his, his uh, fast. Not for the delight of the food. That's not what Imam Nawawi understood. Imam Nawawi said his farha isn't because he's eating a piece of sweet date. His farha is that he completed the ibadah successfully. وَفَرْحَةٌ حِينَمَ يَلْقَى رَبَّهُ And a joy when he meets his Lord. That's when our regno is. Our regno is in paradise. Salamun qawlum min rabbi rahim. Peace. That's when you get peace. There's no peace in this world. There's only peace here in this world. It's in your heart. It's not going to be out. It's always going to be problems in the world. You're always going to have problems. Emotional problems, psychological problems, health problems, uh, sociological problems, problems of, uh, of kufr, of dhulm. All of poverty, all these, this is dunya, it's dunya. Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, you know, the, this adab comes to you, right? Or the sa'a comes, are you going to call on other than Allah when it comes? You should call on God if you're truthful, right? And then, so he removes the harm, right? In sha'a, if he wants, what tansona ma tushirikun, and then you forget what you were associating with. We gave you these tribulations to humble you. That's why he does it. When you're arrogant, when you're up there, you get arrogant. Muslims became very arrogant. I, I, tr trust me. You read our history. Look at the letters that were sent to the year. But they used to send these letters, Ila Kalbi Rum. The Prophet didn't say that. He said, Ila Azim al Rum. To the Alim of Rome. That's how he spoke to them. Because he was trying to win them over. He wasn't belittling them. He didn't have arrogance for them. They had total ihtiqar. I'm telling you, you see it in the books. I've seen it in the books how stupid the Christians are, how idiotic they are, they believe these stupid things. This is arrogance. Would that only when this ba's comes, when you're at six o'clock, it would humble you. But their hearts are hard. And shaitan has made what they're doing appear good to them. Suicide bombing. They think it's a good thing, cutting off heads of Shia. They think it's a good thing. That's all from shaitan. And then, ah, uh, we bring them back up, right? They get all this joy because of what they've been given. We take it all away from them suddenly. فَإِذَاهُمْ مُبْلِسُونَ They're in sorrow and despair. 